And I'll introduce our, our keynote speaker is John Donahoe, who's uh, president and CEO of a familiar company, eBay. Um, and John uh, manages the, the three principal elements of eBay, eBay Marketplace, PayPal, and Skype. Uh, <clears throat> John, before joining eBay, uh, was CEO at Bain & Company uh, and had uh, built on a 20-year career at Bain & Company uh, as part of that process. Uh, John also has a background tied to Dartmouth with a BA in economics here at Dartmouth and then a, an MBA degree from a competitive school at Stanford. So uh, if you uh, will join me in welcoming John here, he's, uh, he's a, a member of the board of directors of eBay as well as Intel and is also on the board of trustees of Dartmouth College. So John, welcome. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Joe, and I, I want to just in front of everyone um, just acknowledge what this school's accomplished. It's been fun for me over the past several years as a trustee to see the way that Thayer is getting stronger and sharper in your focus every year, and I think increasingly even more relevant into the needs of the world. So uh, how many people here are Thayer students of one form or another? I think you guys are at the, uh, the best engineering school in the country if you ask me, so. Uh, you know, it was funny when, um, <clears throat> what, uh, when I got here and read what my talk was supposed to be on, it's on something completely different than what I prepared. I cannot imagine something more boring than the role of information technology and science in the business, in business from design to management operations and scheduling issues. So anyone that wants to hear about that can meet me in the bar uh, down on Main Street about 10 o'clock tonight, because after four or five beers, that might be interesting. Um, what I was told uh, that the theme was going to be on, and I think it is in this conference, is human-centered complex systems. And I thought that was such a cool concept, um, and, and put that way. Um, and it's cool because so much of what I do and what we do is just that. And I thought maybe I, I would like to just start with a, a real brief video that brings a little bit of that to life. So uh, hopefully this. I called the number, the older gentleman answered. Hello. I asked him if he was in uh, World War II. And I went out to the war in 1942, 44th Division, for the 114th, yes, 14th. Every day he talks about his experience in the war, and he's very proud, and we're very proud to have him here. Yeah, I'm proud of him. I'd be back again. So I asked him if he had his dog tags, and he said he hadn't seen him in years. Austria. I think that's why they lost him. I asked him if he'd like to have him back, and he said he would. And that's when he told me he was in a nursing home and uh, was actually didn't have any money. I've been here now four years. That's my home. I don't have a home no more. I had to sell everything I had. I just thought, uh, well, I'll just get them for you. You know, it's a small price to pay. Alma buyer said that his intent, if he bought them, was to donate the dog tags to him. And I said, well, he said, well, good luck, and, uh, you know, I hope you, hope you get the dog tags. You're going to have to be the high bidder. If you're a high bidder, we'll, we'll work something out. And I did get the winning bid of, uh, I think it was like $45. I thought maybe he'd give them to me at half price, and ends up he gave them to me for nothing, so it's pretty nice of him. You know, you have one decision is get the dog tags back to the original owner. So I told my wife, I said, uh, I think I'm just going to put these in a Christmas card and send them to him. I think even he'd appreciate that. So my wife says, be a man. Take them down yourself. <laughs> so she was right. I called the American Legion, said I gotta get these to to leave before Christmas. On uh, Christmas Eve day, we drove down from the American Legion to the, uh, the nursing home. And we went in and uh, we walked down the hallway and found this room. You know, no one was there to set off any trumpets or anything. And Frank, the World War II veteran, uh, 
gave a very touching presentation to Lee. Thanked him for serving our country, and they put the dog tags around his neck. And that's when Lee said, it's the best Christmas present I ever received. The part that really touched me is then Lee got the dog tags. When he saw his mother's name, he just, you know, he just, you know, cried, and uh, it was real touching. And that was the best Christmas I ever had. And so we went out and told his story. And Lee started getting letters. After the story appeared in the paper, it was just like floods of letters came in. Here was Lee in the nursing home who had served his country, and he was basically forgotten. And we got him back to dog tags, and it seemed to give him a new life. I got a whole new family now since I got my dog tags back. It made me feel real good. Real good. Yeah, it made me feel wonderful, really. So the, uh, the reason I show that is I think one of the most interesting trends that's going on in our world right now is on one hand, we're developing technology at incredible rates. And, and technology on the surface is a very dehumanizing thing. But technology is also enabling human beings to connect with one another in a way that, that they never could before. And so this whole notion of human-centered complex systems, I think, is, a, is an incredibly interesting and, and relevant topic, um, both for good and bad, actually, after watching the security uh, panel. But let me just uh, start out. How many people here have used eBay? How many people have bought an item on eBay before? Okay. How many of you have sold an item on eBay? OK, I need you guys to talk to me afterwards, all right? Uh, how many people here have bought something using PayPal? Okay. How many people here have used Skype? Skype video? All right. One of the things that makes my job so much fun is literally hundreds of millions of humans, of people around the world, have interacted with our technologies. And we're, we're really nothing more than a technology provider, a, a software provider in many ways. And uh, it, it makes the whole notion of human-centered complex system come to life. Let me, I'll give you some of the statistics about the, the three platforms that we, we're um, um, responsible for. eBay has 170 million items listed on it today in 50,000 categories. There are eBay sites in 39 countries around the world. 25 million people actively sell on eBay. 80 million people come to the site each month. And $60 billion is traded through the eBay platform. So if eBay was a retailer, which we are not, we would be one of the 10 largest retailers in the world. $2,000 a second sells on eBay. And as you know, we never touch anything. We never touch anything that sells through eBay. One of the statistics that we're most proud of is over a million people make their primary or secondary living on eBay. So it's been a remarkable community, and a, it's a remarkable uh, manifestation of technology and humanity. PayPal also has about 80 million uh, accounts and 80 million active users each month. PayPal's in 190 countries around the world in 19 different currencies. About $80 billion trades through PayPal. And PayPal initially started on eBay, but today over 50%, soon to be 60% of PayPal's off eBay as it explodes to be the best and safest way to pay online. I, when, when Andy got asked the question on the previous panel about where is there too much security, and he said credit cards. He said, merchants have too big a burden to accept payments. I almost blurted out, PayPal <laughs> is just that, because PayPal means all a merchant needs is to have an email inbox. And they can receive safe payments, and the sender never has their financial information exposed. And then Skype. Skype is perhaps the most remarkable of the three. 500 million users in a five-year-old company. Truly global, all three of these are truly global. All three of them have more business outside the US than inside, more users outside the US than inside. 
Uh, Skype is a five-year-old company, and today it represents 10% of the world's long-distance minutes. And so what's common about all three of these businesses is that they were disruptive business models that got put out there and got viral adoption. And if there's anything that our company has done right in the last 10 years, it's not to have been too technology fancy or sophisticated. It's been to follow the humans, follow the users. Because the users have taken all three of these businesses and all three of these human-centered networks in places we wouldn't have imagined. And we talk about enabling and empowering our communities of users rather than trying to control or direct. So I thought, given the topic of human-centered complex networks, I would maybe comment on three, three parts of, of our world, and, and then I'd be happy to answer your questions. So I thought I'd comment on trust and the role of trust in the eBay business, talk a little bit about uh, e-commerce and where at least we see e-commerce going, and then talk about innovation, because and particularly disruptive innovation, but innovation in general, because I think innovation is going through some significant changes on the web. Let me take trust to start. You know, there's a lot of alchemy that's made eBay what it is today. 13-year-old business that, that has the kind of numbers I mentioned. But if there was one secret sauce, one thing that I think Pierre Midiar, our founder, did that made the biggest difference, it would be the feedback system. Now think about what eBay does. You have people, a buyer and a seller, often in two different countries around the world who've never met one another, who are going to buy and sell from one another, send money to and from one another, sight unseen. Right? That, that, that's sort of a, that's sort of a, a mind-boggling concept. Three million cars have been sold on eBay. Imagine buying a car without seeing it or touching it. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon that, that who would have guessed 15 years ago that was possible? And if you're a technologist, you would have said, well, wow, we're going to have to build a really secure site, a really secure software, a really secure system to do that. And we do do that. We have 5,000 people that work in anti-fraud detection. We're fighting organized online crime and, and, and putting people in jail in Romania and in Africa and in China. We've got proprietary fraud detection tools between eBay and PayPal. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning tools, we've, we've got it all. But Pierre Midiar, our founder, said in addition to that, the core value of eBay is we believe people are basically good. And Pierre put in place a feedback system from the very beginning that said, if you have a problem with someone you're buying from something from, work it out with them. Don't call us. If you're selling something and you don't believe your buyer is being fair, work it out with them. And to, to sort of memorialize that, he created the feedback system, where those of you that have bought something on eBay know every transaction you rate the seller. And up until two years ago, and every transaction the seller rated the buyer. And that feedback system became the web's first reputation system. And it, you know, it's harnessing the wisdom of crowds, right? It's, it's saying instead of eBay trying to determine who's good and who's bad, what's right and what's wrong, we're using the wisdom of crowds to do it. The wisdom of crowds and transparency. And it's turned out this feedback system has had a profound impact on the eBay marketplace and trust in the eBay marketplace. Because without us doing really anything other than setting those rules by which you set feedback, Sellers that have higher feedback sell more and get higher prices. So it really matters. What's also been fascinating is it has, it has invoked uh, a human spirit in people. There are many eBay people for whom their feedback is an important part of their identity. They care in ways that are beyond rationality. <laughs> uh, they have 100% feedback, that first negative feedback. They, it, it's as though. It's as though you told them they were a crook. That some, and so it's taken on a strong human dimension, which has translated into people having a lot of accountability and empowerment on our site. Our site, in essence, self-regulates because 
the human dimension of the human-centered networks. And so while we have the technology that's been very powerful to keep eBay trustworthy and safe, it's the human piece that's really been the piece that I think has been the secret sauce. And the interaction between the two has had a very uh, powerful, powerful impact. Let me just talk for a minute about um, e-commerce. And, and I know that's the, the uh, title of this, of this section of our agenda. And, um, and where we see e-commerce going. Because I think we're in a really interesting time on the web and um, in technology in general. And, and the first thing I'd say is that the internet, e-commerce, online payments, we're still in the very early days. You know, it's so strange to see things written that it's, the internet's maturing. E-commerce is 15 years old. Online payments is 10 years old. Skype is five years old. And today, e-commerce only represents 5% of retail, of offline retail. Think about that, 5% bought online. That doesn't make any sense. To me, I, I believe and we believe that e-commerce and being able to buy and sell online should represent 15 to 20 percent at a minimum over the next five years and that we will see a lot of growth and change. And what's interesting is if you think about shopping in the offline world, think about if you were to go down to Main Street today and to go into Campion's. The experience of buying something in Campion's is virtually the same as it was when I was at Dartmouth 30 years ago. Um, you walk in, you find what you want. Maybe the clothes are a little different, although my kids tell me the clothes I wear look like they were bought 30 years ago. <laughs> you take, you walk up to the cash register, you take out your wallet, you take out a piece of plastic, you put it on the table, you pay, and you walk out. The retail experience has had no innovation. The payments experience has had no innovation in the last 30 years. Think about e-commerce 10 years ago. You would sit at a big desktop with a big old CRT monitor. Browsing on eBay was considered a cutting edge experience. And if you bought something, you'd stick cash or a check in an envelope and send it. Think today, 10, 10 years later. E-commerce has changed enormously. Today, we feel really cool and really great about sitting in, in Starbucks or the, you know, the Dirt Cowboy Cafe on the Wi-Fi network on our laptop. And, and we can use search to go from site to site to site to site. And, and if we buy something, we can just pay with PayPal. So while the offline shopping and paying experience has virtually not changed, online's changed tremendously in the last 10 years. But it's still not a very satisfying experience. It's still not a very good experience. And so, so innovation is going to be critical to going from 5% of retail to 20. And I believe in the next three years, we're going to see more change and more innovation in consumer behavior around shopping and paying than we've seen in the last 10 years. And you're going to see those uh, lines between online and offline blur. I'll give you an example. This is not my iPhone. It's Peter Fahey's iPhone that I borrowed for this because I left mine at the hotel. <laughs> eBay will do $500 million of volume on the iPhone this year. $500 million of volume on a device that didn't exist two and a half years ago. On an application, a consumer application that didn't exist a year ago. And an awful lot of that volume is you may go on your laptop or desktop tonight, do a search on eBay, maybe make a bid on something or put it, watch that item and tomorrow when you're sort of sitting in class and you're bored and you're kind of flipping, you, you sort of realize you're outbid or the auction's ending and you buy it. Or you're scanning in a store and you're waiting to see, uh, you're waiting to, uh, see if what you're looking at you can find more cheaply. So that the line between offline and online is going to blur. And the lines between your devices, your, your desktop, your laptop, your netbook, your smartphone, your, even your TV are going to blur. And so you'll see a lot of innovation and change 
in the next three years around how people shop and pay online. Which brings me to uh, my, last, uh, my last topic, which is the role of innovation. Um, at eBay, um, we've made the decision we will be selling our majority interest in Skype because our core business is going to be connecting buyers and sellers. Skype connects people, but not connecting buyers and sellers. And what eBay does is connects buyer and seller. PayPal connects buyer and sellers. StubHub, we own StubHub. We're a shareholder in Craigslist, and we are the Craigslist outside the U.S. and classifieds. Simply connects buyers and sellers. And we've built our businesses by having a mindset of building these platforms, following our consumer, and trying to innovate on our platforms. And what we're discovering is that we're becoming the bottleneck to innovation. Because we have millions and millions of users, and every little feature we create in a, in a, in a platform that's got 25 million lines of code, where we're trying to hit every edge case, we end up being the bottleneck. We can't innovate as fast as we need to. And so the notion of opening up our technology platforms is where the web's going. And I'll, I'll give the example. The iPhone is nothing more than a technology platform. Apple opened up a technology platform. And there are tens of thousands of applications that have emerged in the last two years. That who, who would have imagined some of these applications? Right? Who would have imagined? But Apple is not the bottleneck to innovation. Apple's innovation is to have a robust platform. The innovation is coming from third-party developers and application providers all over the world. And there's a very Darwinian effect. But it's absolutely innovating how we use this device and, and in ways we could imagine and ways we couldn't imagine. Earlier this week, we had our first PayPal developers platform, where we were the first payment system in history that we're opening up our platform. We're opening up our technology because we realize we can't be the bottleneck to innovation anymore. And so we're opening it up so third parties can now be, and then by the way, third parties are often individual developers or small groups of developers who are humans again. We're exposing our technology platform to humans, in this case developers, where I think we'll see an exponential growth in innovations. Are already seeing it. Uh, let me just give you a couple examples of what's already happened. There's a company called Shop Savvy, three or four guys. They've developed an application that you can walk into a store and use this little camera and put it on any barcode. And what it, it recognizes the item, and it shows you prices everywhere online, prices um, of the item in physical stores within a certain amount of distance. Remember, this has a GPS device in it. And then allows you to click on it. And on the end ones, online ones, find the cheapest one in one click, and, and you buy it with PayPal. That is going to have a profound impact on shopping. Because we're never going to, we're always going to be able to get the best price wherever we are, right? We're going to be able to walk into a store, and whatever store you're in, you're looking at, you just scan it. And you see what's it available on eBay, Amazon, Walmart.com. Um, if as, as retailers load their inventory into systems, you'll be able to say, all right, who's got it in stores that are within a mile from me, two miles from me, at what prices? Maybe who's got it on Craigslist and what neighborhood do I want to buy it used? That's an innovation that a third party developer is building, and that'll be launched prior to Christmas. Second example, restaurant. We have some restaurant third party developers who are going to leverage off the PayPal platform where you're going to walk into Murphy's and at the end of your dinner, the, the wait person can come over and say, Mr. Donahoe, do you, uh, here's your check or do you want it downloaded on your iPhone? I said, I'll put, the, put it on my iPhone. And the, the download, the check on my iPhone, I'll put my tip in, one click PayPal, and I pay. Again, if PayPal was trying to develop all those applications, we would never get to all of them. And, and there'll probably be 10 restaurant bill applications. Third one, this one to me is one of the most interesting. Anyone here use Twitter? Anyone heard of TwitPay? TwitPay is a third party developer who built off the PayPal platform. You go to twitpay.com tonight 
and you just link your PayPal account to your Twitter moniker. And you can load money signed with your Twitter moniker. Then you can tweet people money. <laughs> so let's say we go have a beer in, t in town, and I pay, and you tweet me five bucks. I don't have to be a PayPal user to receive it. You don't have to know my PayPal number or my PayPal email address. Now, to get the money out, I can only get the money out via PayPal. So you can only get the money in or get the money out via PayPal. But here's what's happening. People aren't taking the money out. There's a virtual currency building on Twitter. Right? There's a virtual currency where the kids are keeping 25, 30, 40 Twitter dollars, and they tweet them back and forth. Same thing will happen on Facebook. Take it one step further. Virtual banking. So in Kenya today, 98% of the population is unbanked. And there's a company called M-Pesa that is, uh, we don't own this, but this will be built on the PayPal platform over time, this example, where 98% uh, don't have banks, but everyone, bank accounts, everyone's got cell phones. And, and so uh, there's a company called M-Pesa that partner with a local uh, um, the cellular provider. And in Kenya, uh, on all the cellular providers, by the way, in Kenya, it's top up, which it is in most of the developing world, where you don't, you don't have a Verizon or, or AT&T where you buy a subscription. You have a cell phone and you go buy top up minutes at a, at a kiosk somewhere. You go buy 100 minutes or 50 minutes. And so in Kenya, most of the men come into the cities to work while their families stay in the rural areas. And so M-Pesa and Safaricom built a system where um, when the men get their wages, they go to the kiosk and they, in essence, turn the, here's a simple way to think about it, they turn their cash wages into minutes. And they text their spouse minutes or dollars. And M-Pesa built this human network of, of agents that walk from rural village to rural village with wads of cash so that the spouse, it's almost the wife in 99.9% .9 of the cases, so the wife brings her cell phone and says, can you turn the minutes back into cash so I can use it so we can live? Well, what's happening is they aren't translating it back into cash because the women are just using, they're trading their dollars or minutes with their cell phones because they're saying, I'll give you vegetables, you give me a uh, 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 milk, and they're trading. So what's happening is in an unbanked country, a virtual payment system is being built, what is in essence what will be on top of PayPal's platform over time, with third-party applications done on top. And I highlight these examples to see the kind of profound impact I believe we'll see in the next two, three, four years, where innovations and consumer use cases will change how humans live, how humans interact with technology, driven not necessarily by the big companies, eBay, PayPal, Google, Facebook. All, all the companies I just mentioned are all understanding that our role is to develop these robust platforms, these technology scalable global platforms. And a lot of the innovation is going to be coming from outside, from, from smaller people, individuals, entrepreneurs. Think about the places you can pull Google Maps into or Google Earth. So in any event, let me, let me just stop there. I, I think this whole notion of human-centered complex networks is a really cool uh, idea. It's clearly been critical to eBay's success. And I think it's going to be critical to the innovation that we see at least in the web that I deal with on uh, commerce and payments over the next, uh, over the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. So with that, I'm happy to take questions or talk about what's on any, anyone's mind. Anyone's, anything is on anyone's mind. <laughs> uh, questions for John? Yeah. Uh, very simple question. So, uh, in Japan, you can swipe a phone at the point of sale and pay with your physical phone. You don't really need to do any downloading. When are we going to see in the US that phones with the logo PayPal, which we just swipe at the point of sales and we don't care, like, we don't need as many? Yeah. Again, here's where. You, 
have you ever heard of a youth, uh, 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 a um, company called Bump? Anyone have Bump? So Bump is an iPhone app where if this was one iPhone, this is another, we bump it and your contacts exchanged, right? So it's a way to exchange. So if I want to exchange, we just, we just met, uh, Jason and I just met, we're on the panel. If we want to bump contacts, we would just go like this. And <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. And his contacts are now into my outlook and mine and his. So payments could be at that stage um, within a year, I would say. Now, as a user, you may say, I only want to be able to bump up to $10 because I don't want, uh, I don't want to, <laughs> I accidentally bump it. <laughs> I bump it to Jason and I bump him a hundred bucks. Um, today, today you can send money. If you go to load the PayPal application on your iPhone, I can send Jason any amount of money in less than a minute free. Just, it's a peer to peer. And I think you'll see merchants, to, to the point earlier, you'll see merchants accepting that and it will redefine how payments happen. I think the actual what will happen in payments, mobile payments, is it won't be like the credit card system where everyone's got the same point of sale. Where, and there's one ubiquitous system. I think you'll see mobile payments look different in a restaurant than it does in a Nordstrom, than it does uh, you know, playing Zanga, you know, uh, an online gaming. Does that make sense? I think payment chips may work in some applications, but I think it's going to fragment. It's going to, the innovation is going to drive fragmentation, not one ubiquitous system. So what are Visa and MasterCard doing besides pointing in their boots? Well, the, the thing to remember is, um, is uh, we're one of Visa's larger customers because you can tie your PayPal account to Visa or MasterCard or American Express. So um, PayPal rides on top of the banking system and rides on top of the payment system. Um, and, and so uh, we tell them they shouldn't quake in their boots. They should just embrace PayPal as good partners. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, you know, look, they're, they're, they've done a great job of building global payment systems. Being a technology company, we can think in different ways um, than maybe they can. Other questions? Yes, up there. You mentioned uh, like a virtual scanning barcode system that's coming out soon. What's the name of that again? Shop Savvy. Shop Savvy, thank you. That, that'll be, um, that'll be uh, um, uh, launched on the iPhone by, uh, by Christmas. Again, just to give where technology is going, there's also one of the Twitter founders, uh, Jack Dorsey's found, I got a company called Square where you're going to be able to put a little device in your iPhone and swipe a credit card and accept credit card payment. So this notion of, of, of innovation and technology distributing innovation is, uh, I think, going to happen in many different ways. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> that is exactly why you come to eBay. <laughs> because eBay is not a laser UPC based search. So if you go on an eBay and say, I want the iPhone, you get last year's model of the iPhone that's brand new. You get an iPhone that was brand new opened in box. And by the way, last year's model, brand new, you, you may get a used one, a refurbished one. You get all the different models. And what eBay's core advantage will be is to bring back search. What, it's tied to classification technology, but bring back search so that if you can say the item you want not down to the SKU number or put the SKU number in, that you get through um, 
basically technology, search technology, you get all the flavors around it, and then you make conscious choice. So, um, so do I think the retailers are going to fight this? Yes. You, in Japan, where this, um, where this exists, retailers are now shutting down cell phone usage in the stores. <laughs> That's their, and, and you know, I don't think that will work sustainably in this country, but, but it's like trying to buy a mattress, right? You can't get the same, you can't price shop on mattresses because they, every outlet they use different. So it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be fascinating. So what happens when all stores go out of business? <laughs> well, the convenience is still, people still like to go down, go down and, um, and uh, go to a store. So there's certain items that it's still, uh, I mean, I, I look at my own shopping habits. There's certain things that, you know, I want to, clothes. Uh, I like to, I hate buying clothes, but when I buy them, I like to try them on. And if it, in, the, in the store the price is close to what I can get online, I, I'm probably going to buy it there, right? Um, on the other hand, when I'm buying, um, you know, Tom Friedman's latest book, I go on eBay and, and buy it. So I, there's still a very strong role for physical retail, but it's going to force physical retail to innovate in ways that, that really hasn't happened a lot. Yeah, we'll go up there. You've talked a lot about PayPal as, and, and payments as an innovation driver. Yeah. So looking at eBay, again, which has historically been uh, you know, an auction and selling platform, and PayPal as a payment platform, where do you see more of eBay's focus especially in terms of innovation, is driving kind of the, the payment fees or the other side of the equation, which is the, the listing and, and marketplace fees? Yeah, uh, both. So, so uh, what I've said is we have two core businesses, e-commerce and payments. Um, PayPal will eventually be larger than eBay because it serves all of e-commerce, not just eBay. And I think there's enormous... I think one of the ways to get e-commerce from 5% of offline retail to 15 to 20 is to make payments even less, even more convenient, safer, and less painless. Um, and so a lot of innovation will be there. On eBay, I think the innovation is going to be just what I've talked about, which is when you come to eBay, the, the, the eBay sweet spot is not buying the latest, newest um, uh, Blackberry. Um, what eBay sweet, you can get that on eBay, you can get that on Amazon, you can get that on Best Buy, you can get that on Walmart. Everyone's got that. You can get that in the stores, and the prices aren't that different, that of shipping. Um, but what you can get on eBay is millions of small business people finding inefficiencies in the supply chain where you, get, you can compare your price on the latest new one with last year's latest new one, maybe at 40, 50% off, with one that's brand new but was returned in store with one that was refurbished, and, and offer that selection. And I think, uh, I think eBay will be innovating by uh, bringing on what is, in essence, think about the outlet malls in the offline world. All this inventory that retailers don't want hasn't found its way online. And uh, eBay, through our search and our, our trust systems, will be innovating in those areas. Perhaps one more question, and then we'll move to the panel. Uh, Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not a real expert in that. It's funny, I, I, I talked to the, um, the head of the New York Stock Exchange and the head of the uh, NASDAQ, and they both said to me, boy, we're in the same business. And, and eBay is a global marketplace that has an auction mechanism in it, um, um, but it's pretty much focused on commerce. And, and I know technology is having a, a, a profound impact in how the markets, the stock markets evolve and, and some of the same principles of transparency of information and reputation and technology enabling that. But um, it's certainly never an area we considered uh, moving into. It's not, it's not what we're world class at. Um, so. John, thank you for the questions. <laughs>